this time I'd like to call to order the Southern Central School District Board of Education meeting for April 16, 2019. Let the record reflect all board members are present with the exception of Ms. Uh, Melissa Reamer, who is not here at all. At this time, the chair would like to entertain a motion to go into executive session for the following purposes. One, discussing with Acting Superintendent of Schools, Interim Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources and Board Legal Counsel for Labor Relations and Personnel Matters, updates regarding collective bargaining with the Southern so Administrative on. Support Association and Rampo Custodial and Maintenance Organization. Two, receiving legal counsel from the Board of Education Council for Labor Relations and Personnel Matters. Three, reviewing with the Acting Superintendent of Schools and Interim Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, Updates regarding employment history of particular candidates for the position of Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources. Motion. Mr. McKenzie, second. Uh, Don't fight. Mr. Kern. All those in favor signify saying aye. Uh, aye. Uh, all those against, abstain. No. Thank you. There are six of us today. student in the audience? Okay, if our student arrives later, we might have to make another motion <laughs> to change the order. Minutes of the regular meeting of April 2nd, 2019. Motion to adopt the minutes of April 2nd. Mr. McKenzie, second. Who's second? Mr. Parents, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Yes. <laughs> you have to change on April seventh. You can make the motion, but okay. So I think one of us. Yeah. So one of seeing Mr. Karen. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, we're happy this evening to uh, present uh, <laughs> awards or recognition to our National Merit students. I'd like to give it the National Merit Amendment students. Our 
National American Medicine students uh, placed in the top 5% of the 1.5 million students who entered the competition through their performance on the PSAT exam last year. Uh, and they've demonstrated outstanding potential for academic success. Uh, first is uh, Sarah Chen. Julia Christian. <laughs> Stefan Dupreppin. <laughs> Sahil Duta. <laughs> Isabella Glassman. Danielle Manos. Audrey Risco. Uh, next, we'll recognize the National Merit finalists. Uh, the following National Merit finalists placed in the top half of 1% of the 1.5 million students who qualified through their performance on the PSATs last year. Uh, being selected as a finalist opens the door to many scholarship opportunities through the National Merit Scholarship Clearinghouse, and these students are to be recognized for distinguished performance and future academic accomplishment. Uh, Michelle Chen. And I know the other two students are not here because they're working very hard on our robots for their competition next week at National, so Darwin Gu and Ethan Holland. I'd like to call up is Dr. Jill Lloyd. And he's from Stanford. Dr. Lloyd is a Always have to shift these things. <laughs> it's okay, that was a joke. <laughs> Good evening, Southern Central District Board of Education members, Central Administration. Howdy, friends and families. My name is Joe Lloyd. I am the current principal of Slowsburg Elementary, and it's an absolute pleasure to speak on behalf of Mr. Jesse Blasbog, who serves as an instrumental music instructor for several elementary schools in Southern, including Montebello, Richard P. Connor, and Slowsburg. We'd like to ask Mr. Blasbog to join us up front at this time. Jesse joined our school district at the beginning of the 2015-2016 school year following an interview process and demonstration lesson that left our hiring committee quite impressed with his abilities, classroom presence, and incredible potential. In fact, we were so impressed with Jesse's candidacy that Dan McCarter and I considered actually double parking Jesse's car in the Salzburg parking lot until he agreed to join us. <laughs> Jesse drove down from Rhode Island so we liked our chances. Tough crowd tonight. <laughs> and observing Jesse's classroom environment, he's an approachable and focused professional whose students are comfortable and asking questions, taking risks, and learning with him. Jesse will often hold light conversations with students when instructing them. Jesse possesses a keen ability to observe his students' instrumental skills while providing them with prompts and specific feedback. Interestingly enough, following our winter and spring concerts, 
Jesse invites students to his classroom so they can both view and analyze their performances, which we like very much. He's established a supportive classroom environment that promotes high expectations and an emphasis on effort. A proponent of music education, Jesse, Jesse has enthusiastically assisted his colleagues through performing in pit orchestra at the seventh and eighth grade musicals, conducting NISMA solo festivals, and co-training the Intermediate Old County Orchestra Festivals. Jesse, in part time, also serves as Suffern's assistant marching band director. He's a busy young man. Through his, through his time in Suffern, Jesse has displayed a consistent willingness to learn. He's developed a strong rapport with his students, families, and colleagues, and he continues to emit a deep enthusiasm for music education. <coughs> Pardon me. Jesse has demonstrated his own ability to play the violin at a very high level, and we remain quite proud of him in working steadfastly to attain his master's degree in music education while attending the Crane School of Music at SUNY Potsdam. Fantastic, Jesse, that was great. I'd like to respectfully submit that Jesse's work and growth has provided ample evidence that our district indeed made the right decision when we hired him. It's with great enthusiasm and evidence that my colleagues and I place our full support behind Mr. Jesse Blasbaugh's tenure recommendation this evening. Thank you, Sutton. with this week and it was a really interesting conversation based on his violin playing because he was in the pit of Annie when I went to watch Annie and he was fabulous. So Jesse, congratulations. Thank you. I'd like to bring up Dr. Teresa Ivey from Montebello Elementary and she will speak about her candidate. I also have to move these stuff. <laughs> Good evening. It is with great pride that I stand here tonight to make a tenure recommendation for Montebello's speech and language pathologist, Mrs. Sandy B. Simone. Sandy. Montebello four years ago, though I can't remember a time when she was not part of our school community. Sandy has had a powerful impact on the staff and students at Montebello in her time with us. Today I ask students to list some words that describe you. The list captures all who Sandy is to her students, and I thought it would be best to help everyone understand and see who she is and what she needs as students if I shared some of those words with you. Mrs. D. Simone is humble, joyful, amazing, awesome, brave, helpful, mindful, beautiful, passionate, loving, kind, special, calm, clever, respectful, persistent, magical, <laughs> magnificent. Additionally, two students wrote, I love you, Mrs. DeSimone. You're special to the school and me. And another student wrote, there are so many reasons I love you. I don't know where to start. <laughs> One of her colleagues said, we have all found a bright light and a caring friend since Sandy joined Montebello. Other colleagues described Sandy as eloquent, selfless, motivational, encouraging, and inspirational. And Sandy, tonight is a special night and tenure is something to be celebrated. But what I really want you to walk away with is an understanding of the profound impact you have had on the lives you touch. You sent an email to all of us earlier today and thanked us for our hard work and dedication to the students. And I am here to publicly thank you for your passion and commitment to the students and to our school. 
You also said that you have spent the last four years marveling at the resilience and grace demonstrated by your colleagues. But Sandy, it is without reservation that I stand here tonight and say that we have marveled at the resilience and grace you have demonstrated. On behalf of Montebello's staff, students, and parents, we look forward to your continued success, and we thank you for being you. Congratulations. Congratulate all our tenure recipients this evening. Um, and I'm honored to introduce two faculty members from Suffern High School. Uh, the first is Mr. Richard Murray. Please come on up. Special Education and Math Teacher at Suffern High School. He received his BA from the Rochester Institute of Technology and Math and Engineering Studies. He received his Master's of Science in Education from Pace University. Prior to officially coming to Suffern Central, Rich was no stranger to the high school as he had been a special ed math teacher uh, in our in-house uh, Rockland Bosey's program at Suffern High School for nine years. Uh, for the past three years, Rich has taught algebra in both our inclusion and our learning center programs. And what has always impressed me about Rich is his ability to connect and collaborate with students in many different ways. Uh, Rich brings uh, a number of skill sets to the table, aside from his instruction. Uh, for those of you that were fortunate enough to see Phantom of the Opera, uh, you saw a lot of beautiful, elaborate, and technical set designs. And uh, we credit Rich with a lot of that work. Uh, he's worked with uh, about 10 students. Uh, and this is something that just gets better and better every year. Um, and so we are very happy uh, to award you tenure this evening, and we look forward to many years of continued success here at Suffern High School. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Stephanie Powell. Please go on down. <laughs> Stephanie is an ENL, or English as a New Language teacher at Suffern High School. Stephanie received her BA degree from Fordham University and her master's from Manhattanville College. Prior to coming to Suffern, Stephanie worked for nine years as an ENL teacher in grades K through 12 for the Minnesing School District. Stephanie also serves, serves as an adjunct professor at Manhattanville College in their TESOL program, and this year also began teaching through New Pulse in their Master's of Literacy program. During her time at Suffern, Stephanie has taught in our co-taught ENL Social Studies classrooms, our ENL Seminar classrooms, as well as our ENL Emerging classes. 
She has also provided timely and invaluable professional development opportunities to our faculty, uh, which were uh, deeply needed at the time. Uh, for the past three years, Ms. Powell has also been extensively involved in the extracurricular lives of our students. She's the coach of our JV boys volleyball team, co-advisor of IUDA, which means help, a cross-cultural tutoring club, class advisor for the class of 2022, PAC co-advisor, that's Heroes and Cool Kids, and Becca's Closet, uh, a new club that collects and distributes prom dresses to students in need. Congratulations and thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> Very tough act to follow. I got to brush up on my routine. But uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Castaldo, members of the Board of Education. I have two members of our school community here today to present to you for tenure. Uh, right now, I'd like to call up Carolyn Scogin. Come on up, Carolyn. Uh, I, I too will not be holding any hands. <laughs> Uh, Carolyn is currently a special education teacher here at Suffer Middle School. She currently teaches ELA and social studies to our learning center students in grade eight. Carolyn came to us with a, a really strong background. She went to UMass Amherst for her BS in communication disorders, Hunter College for special ed or masters, and Manhattanville College to be certified in BCBA. She's had a wide range of teaching experience before coming to us as well. She taught for seven years in the Bronx as a speech teacher, special ed leave at Montebello and Pearl River in elementary schools, and then we finally snagged her here at Suffer Middle School. If you walk into Carolyn's class, you see incredible levels of student engagement, thoughtful and well-planned instruction, and a laser-like focus on the specific and unique needs of her students. She excels in identifying both academic and social emotional needs of her kids. When you talk to her kids, and I did talk to some of her students, don't, don't be concerned. Her students, her students feel that her demeanor is warm, energetic, and approachable. She teaches some of our neediest students here in our building, and she does so by ensuring that they're included in everything we do. And Carolyn, it also falls, some of this falls into the range of things you don't know about people you hired. I had brought an ENL consultant into her classroom uh, to watch her teach, and the consultant, Dr. Butaro, for those of you who have seen her, knows she's, she's not an easy person to impress, was gushing about Carolyn's teaching, and she walked up to her and said, you did this technique, this technique, and Carolyn's like, well, yeah, I've been, I was trained as a linguist, but I don't know what you're telling me I'm doing right now. <laughs> so, um, but needless to say, I got, the, I got the accolades for that, so thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn has also distinguished herself by becoming involved in the school and community. Her and her family are community members here. She's coached the Suffering Sea Lions for 20 plus years. She's also, she also works in our ENL after school program. Uh, Mrs. Skoglund is married to Mr. Skoglund, and I say that glib, but he <laughs> teaches at Montebello Elementary School. Uh, we've had all three of your children here already. Your daughter Emma's a senior at Suffern High School, Karen is a sophomore, and Kira and uh, your husband Kirk are here with us tonight. So Carolyn, congratulations on your tenure. It's well deserved. Oh. <laughs> 
All right, and my final candidate for tenure this evening is Danielle Castaldo, our assistant principal. Thank you. So, she's my assistant principal. Um, she, I did. I stole her from Dr. Castaldo at PPS uh, several years ago, four years ago, uh, to be exact, and I'm thrilled that I did. Uh, she, she earned this position uh, without a doubt. She came to us with an extensive background that had prepared her very well for being assistant principal here at Central Middle School. Uh, she earned her bachelor's in special ed from LIU, a master's in instructional technology from New York Institute of Technology, and her advanced certificate in district leadership from LIU as well. She started teaching back in 98, right? Margaret Chapman School. She moved on to Chestnut Ridge Middle School teaching students with emotional and developmental disabilities and was at East Chester School District for 12 years before coming here to Suffolk Central School District, I think it was still Radcliffe Central back then, uh, as an administrator. She was the supervisor of elementary education then, and then moved up to be, I don't know if that's moving up, or moved on to be the supervisor of secondary special ed. And then she served as my interim assistant principal for a few months when I really got to know uh, Danielle. Since day one, she's had a positive impact on our school. She has an innate ability to review a process or a practice and bring order to it. I am not the organized one. She is the organized one. As a principal, you always hire people who compliment you. She definitely compliments you. Um, you walk into her office when she's going through a process, there are lots of colorful index cards, highlighters, everything is organized. My desk is all pots. Um, so she's been instrumental in developing a lot of different things here that you know, I, I, I continue, continue to be amazed about. The response to intervention program that we have has led to a tremendous amount of personalized education and multi-tiered levels of support for our students. She's led several curricular initiatives. She worked recently with the Suffern High School History Department and our middle school social studies teachers to ensure common learning experiences for all students. And she's also worked diligently to ensure that our English language learners are integrated within all our learning experiences here at Suffern Middle School. One of the things I'm most proud of Danielle, Danielle for is her work to bring social emotional learning to Suffern Middle School. A few years ago, she worked at the PTA Council to bring the KIND campaign to our school. We always keep track of different kinds of bullying in school, but one of the things we noticed was that we had a problem with girl-to-girl -girl bullying here at Suffolk Middle School. The KIND campaign addressed this issue. We saw an immediate reduction in those bullying behaviors uh, between girls, and it was so successful that even the founders of the organization came here to speak to us the year after that. Uh, thanks to Danielle's leadership, the program is now in its third year, and the feedback we received from students and parents is nothing short of amazing about the positive impact this student, uh, not, sorry, not this student, this program has had on our students. She even sought and pushed for a program for the boys at our school, but it took the guys here a few years to catch up. So we finally rolled out our program this year, so Danielle, it only took me three years. Uh, but to be fair, there aren't as many men here as there are women, so man, we're a little outnumbered, a little outnumbered. Um, Danielle is a valued member of my administrative team. Her perspective is one I inherently value. I could not really imagine running the middle school these days without her. She's part and parcel of the positive, positive culture she's helped to create. And she continues to exceed my expectations in everything she does. And really the best thing about her is what you see is what you get. Getting tenure tonight, it's not gonna change who she is. She's still gonna speak her mind to me. She's still gonna tell me what she thinks of me. Sometimes behind closed doors, there's some colorful language related to that. Uh, but I have no doubt that awarding Danielle tenure is, uh, is one of the best things we've done here. So congratulations. Thank you. second time here at Suffern Central because she was here before as uh, a member of the PPS department and we still miss her greatly. Great asset. <laughs> 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 
That remains to be seen. We can have a conversation. Okay. I don't know. I know her well. We did do that that advanced certificate. Danielle and I did together at LIU. So we've known each other a long time. And uh, she's married to the Costello boys from North Rockland, and I'm one of the Costello girls from North Rockland, and we are not related at all. I <laughs> think we are, and the best is when I'm asked if I'm her mom. Her <laughs> may assume I'm her sister. So. Okay, our next person up for um, receiving tenure tonight is one of our administrative team, Ms. Angela Aguilar. I did her last name justice. She rolls that hair <laughs> that much better than I did. Angela began her career actually at Suffern Central at Suffern Middle School as an assistant principal. And I'm sure if I asked Brian Fox today, he'd still say that he misses her and would like her back. He wants all three of you. I don't need to make one. And Teresa, he wants all of them. She was a great addition at the middle school and they were sad to see her go. But their loss was Cherry Lane Elementary School's game. Angela has been principal there for four years and has made quite a mark. She is a highly organized, thorough, and detail-oriented detail leader who meets her staff and her students where they are and helps them grow to the next spot. She fosters collaboration among her staff to meet her school's goals. She has been supportive of innovative programs at Cherry Lane Elementary School's <coughs> makerspace, learning opportunity groups, family literacy night, and in collaboration with the PPS department, our primary and early foundations classes. Additionally, Angela was, is always quite open and flexible and this year offered to host one of our community collaborative partnerships. So she actually hosted some people who were getting their teaching assistant certification for um, teaching assistants in our early foundations and primary foundations classes at, who are currently at the camp for the blind, it, it sits in Chestnut Ridge. So we were able to offer those people a collaborative teaching assistant experience so they could earn their degrees. And Angela was a big piece of that program. Angela has fostered effective relationships with the families of Cherry Lane and demonstrates genuine caring and concern for her students. She promotes and models the common goals to educate their hearts and their minds of her students, and we are proud to have her here at Suffering Central. Congratulations on your tenure. Director of Principal Personnel Services. She's receiving tenure as Supervisor of Elementary Special Services at ENL. Taryn had to leave us because her daughter was in a concert tonight in North Rockland. I'm going to read the letter regarding her nonetheless, so it's in the record. So if you could all just bear with me. In her four short years here at Suffern Central, Taryn has become an integral and pivotal member of the PPS department. She was built. Build strong relationships with families and suffering faculty and has used those relationships to build collaborative plans to support students. I'm sorry. She has been instrumental in creating instructional programs at the elementary level that have allowed Suffern Central students to obtain instruction in their community with their peers. 
Taryn has extensive knowledge of and, ex and ex access with ease of out-of-district resources that support Suffern Central students and their families. She has deep connections with other county agencies and calls upon these whenever it will assist our students. Additionally, Taryn has led our ENL program, K-12, providing professional development, support, faculty evaluations, and facilitating the New York State bilingual grant to ensure that our ENL students receive the instructional opportunities they deserve. Congratulations, Taryn. It has been an honor to work with you. Congratulations to all our tenure recipients. Uh, you've been already an integral part of the Suffern Central team, and today we celebrate you. So, and welcome to all your families to celebrate with you. <laughs> Feel free to help yourself with more refreshments and <coughs> delicious uh, food over there. We're going to ask um, our principal. Pat Reed to come back because some of our students' uh, merit awards uh, recipients are here with us now, so we're going to call them up. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Just going to uh, pull up our national merit uh, commended students. The following National Merit Commended students placed in the top 5% of the 1.5 million students who entered the competition through their performance on the PSAT have demonstrated outstanding potential for academic success. Sarah Chen. National Merit finalists placed in the top half of 1% of the 1.5 million students who qualify for their performance on the PSAT. Being selected as a finalist opens the door to many scholarship opportunities for the National Merit Scholarship Clearinghouse, and these students are to be commended and recognized for their distinguished performance and future academic accomplishment. Michelle Chen. And Ethan's doing robot. So, congratulations. Uh, yesterday was the band Bonanza at Suffern High School. 
Uh, and tomorrow will be the string extravaganza at uh, West High School. Uh, April 19th begins spring recess, and that will be until April 29th. On uh, April 30th is the History and English Honor Society induction uh, for juniors and people in those honor societies. Uh, May 1st is the Stir Symposium, where the Stir students will present the projects they've been working on. Um, May 2nd is the Senior Art Showcase for seniors in AP Art. And on May 6th, uh, AP Exams. up about 1.9 million dollars and that's basically explained much of it besides raising more by these staff changes. Uh, we talked about this for adding the bilingual grade one which is mandated, elementary guidance which is mandated, maintenance supervisor which is the reinstatement of the person that we um, promoted to the director of facilities, adding somebody in technology, we have some retirements, uh, a couple part-time enrollment-based FTE reductions, and two elementary people that uh, may be able to fill some other positions that we have open, but we, we don't know. Um, last time I just gave a quick update on enrollment, and we talked about the FTE reductions, and part of that is the enrollment. Uh, this was a number, of, um, and kind of got ignored by, I know we're going to talk about the uh, uh, rebalancing later, but um, anyway, right now we have about 211 incoming Kenny and outgoing about 296. Benefits was a uh, big reduction for us this year, and that offset some of the other costs. Uh, basically, we had a huge decrease in the TRS rates, which is our highest uh, retirement. We have both TRS and TRS rates, which are the teacher's retirement, and that dropped all, nearly 2%. ERAS rates were flat, and um, we estimated health insurance would increase usually it could be eight to ten percent. This year was about five percent, so that was a, not a cost savings, obviously, but less than it usually is. Um, we had some questions. We had some questions about this last time. Uh, we actually changed this from special education to special services because although 11, almost eleven million of it is special education costs, there's other costs like. Um, Health services, which is we talked about, we provide services for the schools in our district. We have nursing services, and we charge them back to the district for the origin of those children. And some other minor costs that are in there. So what I wanted to say that's important is that special services budget does not include salaries. So as we create these new special education classes, the, the special services budget decreases mainly because of OCs or private tuition, as we bring these children back in, our salary budget increases, but it looks like the special services number is decreasing, but that is far from the truth. As you see, just an example, in 17-18, we had a budget of 11 million three twenty two, and we actually spent about $600,000 less that year. So, there's, so even though it looks like there's a decrease, it's because things are moving around, and we, we're not ending any programs or anything in special education. Uh, the other thing that I want to talk about was debt service. So I talk, we talked about this the other day when we were saying that we knew that we were going to have about a $2.3 million uh, shortfall because of the way the bonds were um, aided back 15 years ago when we first started some of these projects. We got aid on the, on the project as soon as we started the project. Now you have to wait for a final cost report before you start getting aid. And we also, some of the debt services out longer than the eight. So right now, as, and I want this show several years, so you understand that I know we reduced our, our um, <coughs> used a million dollars basically in reserve this time and lowered our tax rate. But you're gonna have the same problem over the next two years because even though we're using $636,000, the rest of that debt service reserve that we talked about, that's only for building projects, 
we're going to still have a deficit of $830,000 and a year after about a million dollars. So we're going to have to find money for that. Uh, the other thing we talked about is transportation. Those costs are mainly due to the non-public increase. As you can see, we have about 300,000 oh, 300, more children, which is, uh, is about $600,000 in cost. We also added a bus, which is about between ninety-five dollars and $100,000 for this rebalancing. We're not 100% sure what we're going to need, but we have to be prepared for it in the budget. So just as uh, you can see, and it's a little small, I apologize, but the, this is the non-public transportation over basically the last 10 years. And you can see that we had, in the first, like, from 10, 11 to maybe 13, 14, it was pretty steady, and then it started to increase. And the last few years, it's really exploded. So that the costs are going to go up, and I, I don't, we don't know anything that's going to be any different. So this year, at the beginning, I believe it was 793. I'm sorry, and then um, at the end of the year, we actually added 115 more kids, so it was eight. I'm used to being closer when I make these uh, presentations. So we had uh, 833, and then we added 115 kids during the year. And now, um, recently, we have 1136 children. The other thing is uh, buildings and grounds, and we have some initiatives we're going to do next year. Uh, some of the things we're going to do is talk, we're trying to increase our uh, the PA systems throughout the schools to make it better safety-wise. We're going to install air conditioning units. Some of the stuff is actually being done now. We find that we have a little money for some project. Uh, maybe it didn't cost us as much, so we go ahead and do that. Uh, the other thing we're going to do for safety reasons is the Montebello sidewalk. Um, because of the, we talked about this last time, the children, it's a very small area for Montebello and, their, and the drop off and pick up, and we want to make it safer for the students, so we're going to put a sidewalk on one side and keep all the students on one side. Uh, we've been working on it, some LED and ceiling upgrades, which will continue. We're going to do some library improvements at Biola, some painting. And we're going to start improving our playgrounds in the elementary schools every year. The other thing that came up was other, which is about six million dollars. And you see that spread mostly in planned balance, which planned balance is several million dollars that we use. We get our money mostly from taxes. And you'll see that later. We don't get taxes till September. I need some cash to be able to run the business in the summer. So when you have to do that, we kind of build in a fund there. And on the other side, you see it in our revenue. So it's like a wash, but at least I have some cash at the beginning of the year, which is left over from the prior year, so I'm able to run the business during the year. And um, this is where the money goes. So you see most of our costs are salaries and benefits and um, special services uh, and all a, little, a little piece of the pie, but most of it is uh, salaries and benefits. Oh, I'm sorry. Can we go back to the other slide a second? Uh, one more. So what I wanted to talk about is, I know you asked me that to, I had put $100,000 more in the legal fees, so I took that back out. Um, I wasn't sure, like, I, I, I spoke to, or I had somebody speak to Shaw, that the formula was a little different, but you asked me to do it, so basically I did it, but I did add that money back to, uh, to uh, benefits because of the debt. Yes. Teresa, I, I, I know we talked the other night there, we didn't have, we. Did we get a bill from Shaw for for his for what he's done so far? Uh, no, we, I, I'm missing February and March. I've actually I'm I'm, I'm concerned about the legal fees and what they're going to be. So I did email him and I emailed our, our other attorneys. Yes, February I, I actually did get it tonight. I actually did email. So um, I actually I didn't realize we actually had February like. And now we have March, right. and I've asked them both for for the invoices. I got that one today. Right. When I get that, I will share that. But um, yeah, I am concerned what our legal bills are going to be, and see if we have you know what kind of money I might have to move around. So I did ask about that. So. Uh, but you did put the hundred thousand dollars back into. No, I actually the, the excess was to take it out, and, and that's what I did. Then where are we going to get it from? Why in the dental benefits? Well, the dental benefits are real. We had a little. I actually spoke to the person, 
from benefits because there was a little confusion about the cost of the benefits and we thought they were going down and they weren't. So I basically added that back. Um, well, you know, hopefully, hopefully they'll be under. If not, we'll have to find somewhere. To but you were comfortable when we when we spoke last week. You were very comfortable putting a hundred thousand dollars in. In fact, I think you even led me to believe that we're probably going to go over the hundred thousand. Well, here, here's how I do. When we do the budget, we compare the last few years of our of expenses. So what I did this year, that where I got that hundred thousand dollar number from, was I looked at the cost per hour of our legal fees now for our current attorney and the cost per hour for other attorneys and they're about 40% more and that's how I got the $100,000. But it seemed like the consensus that they wanted, you know, I, I talked to them, I, the formula was... So when we, when we ask the attorneys that have picked up additional responsibilities beyond special ed because they're representing us for um, personnel and labor, um, they're feeling um, system is very different and they said we don't anticipate an increase even though that is not we're paying them 40 percent more and, and you tell me we're not anticipating yes yeah, so it's increase. a discussion that I, one you one have one to one look one at one both one types one. of bills actually that were forwarded to you and you'll see a huge difference in billing style but we're paying 40 percent more so we're paying the guy but if you have fewer hours the outcome yeah. is a smaller tool how do you find fewer hours with what's going on? By comparing the bills we received. The billing style is very that. different. I can't believe that. Well, that's what the attorney is not Well, they can say anything. When we get the bill, we've got to pay it. <laughs> the billing style for special ed has been with the district for a very long time, right? Um, for special education, to use the same term. You might know that better than I do. They took it well before I started. So. Right, so they've been representing the district for a long time. So we have a pattern that we can look at. Right. Well, and it's very different. We have a new pattern yeah. here from, from Mr. Short. It's the here. same for. We're paying 40% more than what we pay Mr. Franson. They, they charge for special education more hourly already, and it's a different, different type of bill. You will see different type of bill, but it's still 200 and some dollars an hour, as opposed to but zero last but, year. But what she's saying is there's less hours now. The less, the less hours compensate for the more hours that, more well, I'll be happy to hours. see that. I, I you have, you have it on your email, that's the thing. You received all okay. the bills for a year and a half on your email. We didn't get any bills from February from Mr. But Shore. you have the same firm covering the last year and a half for special ed. It's the same exact. I'm not talking special ed. I'm talking the same firm bills the same way. Four hours, there's more time, there's more time. I think, yeah. I think what Tom is saying is that <coughs> special ed is special ed, or special services is special services. Um, but this is in addition to <coughs> which is not part of special services. So if it's an addition, therefore there's other hours. There's additional hours that that firm is going to be working with us. Instead of another. The other firm is Thompson, and his hours will be declining. Right. And Shaw's will be going up a bit. Right. At 40% more. Right. At, at, at 40% and, and if you look at the, if you open the, the mini files that Ms. Isolde forwarded, it's a very different type of bill. It's not as many hours in general at all. Okay. And, and it's a different type of practice. And we actually hear that there's supposed to be a certain average for a district, a certain size. And yes, if you have other legal issues going on, okay. you, you factor for that. Even factoring for that, it will never hit the numbers that um, were added after the budget was already set up. Okay. And that was an addition, if you recall, on um, March 19th. Okay. That wasn't in the original budget. All right. But let's let's talk about the two months that we don't have. And I and I, and I think we all like to see those two months from from both firms. All right. All right. I'd like That's to. One, one thing. Mm -hmm. And. I know that average, this is not an average district, we're above average in everything that we do. So I think that we should be thinking that we also. Right, but, okay. but I was advised 
by the attorneys that that was very inflated and that we don't need to budget that much of that. So, and they have, and they have, if you look at the trend, no, but if you, if you look at month to month, even though we didn't have summer in March from both firms, we didn't right. have that, it has declined. Teresa, is it normal to be two months behind in your building? Well, that, that happens sometimes. It's not, it's not that normal, but I'm going to ask them to keep up to date month to month because I think that's important. Because we, you know, right, and, and, you know, truthfully in the past, we've had an idea of what the bills are. They've been kind of close every month around the same, and we know what's going on, and now I, I don't know. I don't exactly. know all the work that's being done. And if it is if it is a higher another line will come out lower, so it's not it's not a, a risky practice to move things shift things around as needed, correct? Right? Well, I'll be able to shift from another item if you're a little over, but it's not a hundred thousand I don't I can't answer that. His his formula, what what you're saying is an average he he, he explained that he takes the budget and takes a percentage of that and that's how he figures that. You know, it's hard to say because you're switching from one to the other. So basically, I always try to go on past expenses. That's how we build the budget. It's not just legal fees. We do that with everything. We look at what we spent and what caused certain things to be higher or lower in here. And then, in this case, what I did was go through those few years, take 40% because of the increase in, and it's, you know, it doesn't have, you know, I know we're going around for an RP, that's why I did. It could be somebody different. That's, that's a different charge, but at, at right now, this rate, I thought it was a comfortable situation to add the 40%. You guys didn't want me to, and I took it out. Are we going, could we have a, a problem? We could have a problem this year. We could have a problem right. next year. Okay. Thank you. Revenues. So the other side of a budget is revenues, and um, I wanted to explain just a couple of things. I talked about the plan balance, which is where I build in some expenditures on one side, so I have money to spend during the summer, and here's the other side. So the money that we, we have in the budget this year will become revenue in the next year because we don't spend it for the summer, which is the next year. It's a little complicated, but that's how we're able to pay our bills during the summer. So a big part of this is the un um, unclassified revenues and pilots. Some of that is BOCES refund because BOCES doesn't make any money, so at the end of the year, everything they have left, they split between the districts. But a big part of this is uh, over two million is um, pilots. Pilots are payments in lieu of taxes. A lot of times a company might, like Avon, might want to move out, but we give them some kind of incentive to stay. Somebody like Ray Warren Flanagan, when dress barn clothes, might want to move in, so we give them an incentive to stay. And all of this is actually done through the town of Ramapo, it's not really our thing. But uh, it's, you know you have some kind of steady income with these companies, and you know they have a 20-year plan, a 15-year plan, whatever it is that they're going to be staying and having that tax revenue for years. The other thing I want to explain quickly is state aid. So we get money from the state. Um, the biggest thing I want you to look at here, and I tried to explain it before, was the drop in building aid. Uh, because of the way that the state does state aid on buildings, we had a big $2.3 billion fall this year in, in state aid from building aid, and that's a big deficit that we had to make up. Some of the other things involved here in that big state aid number are our foundation aid, which is just a general aid, uh, high cost, private excess cost, supplemental excess cost, all have to do with special education and the cost of students. Um, Another thing is transportation aid. We get uh, an aid ratio based on our transportation, high tax aid. So some of these explain some of them. Foundation aid is unrestricted. All those others are special ed. Transportation is non-capital expenditures based on the formula. We get back about 54% of what we spend. High tax aid is when the tax levy exceeds just the gross income of the general public in Southern Central. Software, library, and textbook are all rates per student. It depends uh, for software and library to students that are physically located in Southern Central borders, whether they are going to public or private schools. Uh, for textbooks, it's our students and wherever they go. Either they're here or they might be in other schools throughout the county, but we still give them textbook aids. Hardware is a small, it's like $50,000 that's spread over our student. Building aid, I explained a little. And BOCES aid, we get aid on many of our BOCES expenditures at almost 68%. That's a little misleading because you only get a certain amount on people with salaries and you don't get it on certain special ed, but uh, BOCES aid is 
as a big thing. This year, I worked with the technology department to spend some money this year, so we'll have some extra aid last next year, which is how we were able to raise our revenue. Where are the oops? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so the drop in building aid, that was something that we kind of knew was, was coming. Yes. But but this is statewide, or is it just no? No. This so what happened us. was in 2001, we got our six, well, we borrowed $62 million okay. for all the used reservations. In 2004, we borrowed $18 million. In 2002, when we did our, our, our it was called the SA-139, we basically said, this is how I'm going to spend my money. The, the, the job was approved. We started getting aid. But we borrowed bonds over the period as we were spending the money. Okay. So we started with 14 million, then we borrowed 38 million, and that's when we started paying the debt on those bonds. Right. Also, the debt on those bonds are basically 20 years, where the aid is 15. So there's that drop off. We do things differently now to make it a little easier for people. So that's what that was. Yeah, so about five years now we've been talking about it, and here we are, and we're really gonna, I'm gonna show you a little bit more that explains when that stops. But, uh, so the money both basically comes from the taxpayers, you, me, everybody else here that lives in Southern Central, uh, and we get state aid and there's some other small um, revenue sources. This year, we're uh, <coughs> proposing a 1%, the board decided on a 1% tax levy. Our budget to budget is under 1%, and the total proposed budget is 141 million, 223, 319. Proposition one, and that's what we're going to vote on on May 21st, is shall the, shall the annual budget be levied? And then I want to talk about proposition two, and this is the verbiage for it, but next slide. So basically we do capital reserve projects, and two years ago the public approved a $10 million $10 million project. Um, where every year we can fund part of that, and then we ask the voters to approve the projects that we want to do. So some of the stuff we're going to do is, a lot of it is uh, safety oriented. We're going to be doing a, a replacement of a transformer at Slosburg Elementary, which is why we're not going to have the town around Poe camp this summer. We, we had no choice. Supper Middle School, we're going to fix the facade. There are several phases involved in that. Uh, we're going to resurface the track. It's from 2004. There's cracking. We, we, we can't have kids running around and getting hurt. The thing, and we showed this a couple, I think, in the beginning of March. The thing that is very interesting, and when Brian, Fox, when Mr. Fox um, showed us, it's this challenge course for the physical education for the middle school students, and it's sort of like a uh, obstacle course, but a little more intense. And we loved it. And I, I think it's something that the, the children, the taxpayers, will really enjoy. Uh, some of the other things we're doing in Suffolk High School are necessary roof restoration, uh, chiller pump, which is um, the HVAC system, the air conditioning system, and the library room. So those things have to be done. So hopefully the taxpayers on May 21st will approve that as well. On Tuesday, May 21st, the polls open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. That's it. Any questions? I want to start by saying thank you very, very much because um, it, was, it was only Thursday that this budget set 2% increase over the tax. I lost a couple of weeks. <laughs> over the uh, previous budget, and now it's at 1%. And we appreciate the work that you have done over the weekend, the last few days since Thursday, um, based on the direction uh, I believe all the board's members, um, pretty much the majority, 90% of the board members, like that is a lot, um, have asked for and, and thank you for that because uh, alleviating the tax burden um, is definitely important to encourage new young families to move into the district. We also very strongly that we need those numbers we need um, to make new homeowners be able to afford homes in our neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, so thank you, I appreciate all the work you did. Um, and if you can maybe um, just in very general terms explain how you came down to the one where the movement is. So, you know, as I stated before that I basically trimmed the budget because if you remember we were $763,000 that we needed to make up when we first got it. That actually was over 900. 
200,000 I got from the uh, revenue that we received from the state along with purchases that the um, Eric and the technology department worked with me about. Um, so 700,000 I cut as much as I could. So the only way place I could really get that extra money was reserves. So I, I put a you know, general reserve reduction. Uh, so we have the $900,000 reserve and we have another you know, million or so dollars for that. And uh, that's as simple as that gets. So the only movement that happened from Thursday's presentation to today is taking the difference from the reserve. Well, I moved the two expenditures. I like, explained. I right. subtracted the hundred thousand for the legal. Well, and somewhere I, else, but nothing yes, came but no, nothing came up except from reserve. Exactly. Just wanted to do that. Okay. More questions? Good. Anyone? Thank you, Teresa. Yeah, well. Good. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Aye. 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 All those again. 
against? Any abstain? Okay. We'll move down to 2.05. Motion. Second. Second. Discussion. I just wanted just a little background because we haven't discussed putting this particular RFP out. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. The discussion in the fall was that any scale contracts. You know what? I'll wait to. Go ahead. I'll just talk loud. <laughs> yeah, I, again, I just wanted clarity because we haven't discussed this particular RFP, so I just want to get any background that there is. So back in uh, back in July when uh, we had our reorg meeting on yeah. July 10th, uh, the direction uh, most people felt was can we review all our con current contracts where the district is engaging in consulting or external services of any type and should any of them be stale or not current can we put them out for um, a request for bids and, or a request for proposals depending on which one and we started off by um, if you recall uh, recently uh, approving an RFP for our architectural services. Uh, Dr. Stelter brought to our attention that our um, current special education council contract is also not current. So nothing against so, the services, but so no, that's what our so contracts this, are. Right, so this one Dr. Stalvin just brought up over the last two weeks. That's yeah. why it's here tonight. Yeah. And that's why we haven't had any conversation about it prior. Yeah. That's yeah. Fine. It was brought to our attention that it's stale. So following the same rule okay. that we've been following, it was put yeah. on act correct. Just wanted the background. Any further questions or discussion on that item? Okay. Everyone is ready. We will vote on item 2.05 RFP Special Education Council. Motion. Move. Oh, sorry, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any abstains? Any nays? Item is moved. Moving down to 2.07, the 2.19, 2019 uh, 2020 uh, budget adoption. Um, that the Board of Education adopt the 2019-2020 budget in the amount of $141,223,319. Motion. Moved. Mr. Shapiro, second. Second. Mr. Karens, discussion. Yeah, I would just like to uh, mention, as I did last week, uh, my objection to reaching into the into the reserves uh, to cover a uh, one percent difference in the budget we know we have some issues with the, possibly issues coming up with the utility companies the governor's office and i don't think we're being prudent in taking monies now when we know we have a couple of shortfalls coming in the next couple of years and possibly a $2 million loss of revenue from the utility companies. I just have a problem reaching into the revenues. I'm, I, I, I can't support, uh, support taking over 1% uh, having the budget. Uh, most people tend to have uh, their best week. So you'd like to raise the tax 2% instead of 1%, correct? Okay. Basically, if there's a controller's uh, audit that was done a few years ago, and in it the recommendation said district officials should develop a plan to use surplus fund balance and unnecessary reserves in a manner that benefits district taxpayers. Basically, the district has been overtaxing the community for number of years now. Sure. It's great to have those large fund balances of millions of dollars, but it's not doing the taxpayers at this point any good. So to take some of the funds out, the control office has said 
that Suffren Ramaphosa Dental has been doing this for a number of years, and you should basically use those funds and not keep on basically <coughs> putting them into a fund balance and then you know asking the taxpayers to increase their taxes in Suffren when we know that taxes in the village, probably taxes in the town, will be going up. We're supposed to do basically uh, fiscal responsibility, and this is part of it. There was also a NICET report done last year with regard to suffering and looking at the finances, and basically it stated the same thing that the Controls Office, uh, office stated a few years ago, that the district is collecting too much money from the taxpayers, and it's time basically to stop that a little bit and use some of the funds to keep the tax down for you because we're all going to be paying that, and I think having 1% tax is better than having a 2% tax or more. Could you? Mr. Shapiro, any comments? No, not at this time. No. I just wanted to ask Mr. Mr. Kent, the, the report you're reading from, yeah. can you just give me the date of the report? Right, the date was uh, 2011 through 2013, okay? And the nice report was done last year. So the report from 2011 to 2013, I just, do you have the date of the actual filing of the report by chance? I'm sorry? Do you have the date of, I get some kind of feedback, but the date that that report was filed or presented? Uh, it's September of 2015. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kern, any further comments or questions? No. Mr. McKenzie? <coughs> I think uh, Mr. Collins articulated it just fine. Uh, I'd like to just clarify on, on the item uh, regarding the utility bill. Uh, we are, as a district, advocating against utility-owned uh, land getting any reassessments to reduce their tax burden because that, um, should that happen in the state of New York, that will increase the tax burden on the taxpayers. It does not take any money out of the budget or the district. It does not reduce our revenue. It unfortunately adds the burden on the residents of the district. Therefore, any break we can provide our community members now so that it doesn't cumulatively increase exponentially, we should do it while we can and while the district can afford it without reducing any staff. There are no layoffs. And without reducing any progress in suffering center. So hopefully we can continue together to advocate against that tax reduction on utility owned land. It's very important that we stay uh, vigilant on that and that it doesn't pass, but it would not reduce uh, the income to the district. It would shift whatever utility companies are paying for a large percentage of it to the residents. So I just wanted to clarify that. that. There are no further comments or questions. Um, we will call the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those against? Aye. Mr. Donnelly. All of those abstain. None. Item move. Next is two point one seven. Mr. McKenzie, full motion on the floor, please. Mr. McKenzie, second. Second. Mr. Shapiro, discussion. I just need to uh, abstain from this vote because she's a friend. Okay. For alerting us to that. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those against? None. Any abstains? Thank you. One abstain, Mr. McNancy. Item 2.18, policy 1120. Um, this is the third reading. The policy needed to be voted on at the second reading, but um, it was preferred and requested that it stays as a discussion for the second reading. So today is the third reading on the policy. The policy has to do with FOIL appeal request. 
which currently the regulation states that the requests go to the uh, president of the Board of Education as a representative of the board. And now the policy would align with the current regulation. Motion. Mr. McKenzie. Second. I just wanted to sort of reiterate from the last time we told this that the wording in the policy as you are trying to approve tonight is outdated and in this book of regulation as of January 2016 is for the superintendent to receive oil appeals and not for the board president to receive oil appeals. And since the policy hasn't changed since we pulled it, I feel it's necessary to say it again. Um, so I'll respond to that uh, real quick. I uh, reached out to NISPA's um, policy uh, uh, department um, and it took a few calls. That's why I didn't have this information before. She just returned from maternity leave, and uh, they, their um, their samples are intended to be open-ended, where districts can elect whatever is convenient and works for each individual district. So they don't have a rule as to who the appeal should go to, and they she reiterated it's totally up to obviously the board of education to elect what works for for that you know the majority of the foils that are coming in should they go to you know one party or the other um, assuming at the end of the day that all foil appeals go back to the attorney for review and to the board clerk thank you for all the work you've been doing i know you've been busy heather um, and that the board president is not the or the, or the superintendent are not indicative of who's going to make the final call. It's still going to be checked from a legal perspective and, and go through the same process, but with a finer comb, basically, since the first uh, response did not um, produce an outcome that the FOIL requester is satisfied with. It doesn't mean the second response is going to be any different. It's just checks and balances and a second round at it. So that's what she is going to Okay, I'm curious, because again, last time we spoke about this, and I said that I had spoken with policy department in his book, which is the email that I have here, which again states that it should be the superintendent, and that's direct from the policy person at his book. So I'm just curious if you had that in writing. No, we had a verbal conversation, and I'd be happy to share her name. She okay. just got back to her department. So maybe now more than ever, we should be on this if you and I have conflicting information apparently from NISBA. I mean, this was uh, reviewed by Mr. Thompson so. and edited direct the policy committee meeting. Um, okay. The policy committee made the recommendation to the board, and I think we need to act on it. It's the third meeting already. You also you said that that was a just for regulation. I don't think it's a regulation. It is. It's right here. I think it's a recommendation. Oh, it's a regulation. <laughs> yeah. This board doesn't make regulations. And here's the open one. Right. This is one a sample. Yes, the sample is the regulation that they provide. The regulation and the the is what they're using to describe a policy. The policy is the regulation, but NISPA does not regulate right. school boards. If we have different interpretations, then that's fine. Um, but again, since we have such different interpretations, perhaps it's improper to vote on it right now. But if we want to vote, then we can vote. It's not improper because it's the third reading, so it's going to be up to the Board of Education to vote. And again, NISPA does not regulate school districts. The Board of Education vote on the regulation. If they call it regulation meeting, so the word policy is the regulation. So it's the third reading, so we need to take action. Um, and again, Mr. Thompson did the revision, um, followed the policy committee meeting on January 29th. Sorry. January 29th is what we met. So it's been overdue since January 29th. Matt, in the uh, in the form that you just handed me here, in the second paragraph where it's shaded, it says NISPA suggests adding the underlying text. That's all it says. It says it's a suggestion. 
Okay. So don't we like to follow the suggestion of, we have of the authorities that we tend to ask for? We have several policies for? where the wording is different from the suggested language. This is not the only one. Look, so. we, we, we can vote. Right. Mr. Curry, quick question. Yes. Um, the item comes in and it goes to the superintendent. The superintendent makes the decision and denies. Okay. So the appeal process, according to what you're saying, mm -hmm. Then we'll go to the superintendent again, right? So the superintendent has basically denied it the first time around. Why in the world do you think the superintendent on the appeal would then say, you know, it's, uh, I'm going to deny it or I'm going to accept it? What this policy does, it goes to the superintendent first, and, and then on the appeal process, okay, it goes to the uh, the board of education, the president. Um, that um, seems to, it seems to be uh, a pretty fair yes. way yeah, of doing not, something. We don't want the same person making, the, uh, yeah. doing the first decision and then doing the appeal. Personally, that's my opinion. Okay. Okay. It, it's also important to note that when it comes to the president, it doesn't mean that the president makes a unilateral decision. The president brings it to the board, the board deliberates on it, and the board makes the decision. So it's not as though the superintendent like in the case of the superintendent, where he just makes a decision or she just makes the decision and that's it. It comes to the president, she brings it to the board, the board make, collectively makes a decision, and that's the point. I, I, I'm not so sure that the process that you're describing is entirely accurate. So, again, how is it? There's a, there's a process, there's, there's it's denied. Where, okay. And then where does it go? I don't have, have to process this with me because that, we weren't prepared to discuss this tonight. It's on the agenda since I No, it's the process before the process. But it only defines here. where it goes to, and we had a discussion about this twice at the first and second yeah. meeting. Again, I don't agree with it. I'm saying my, my no, case for not agreeing with it. If you so want to just, call the vote, uh, vote. Also, the attorney direction at the policy committee meeting was. I just want clarity. Your current policy doesn't say where appeals go. Correct. It and not. it's up to the board to select how it's processed. It all has to come back to legal because mm -hmm. none of us can make legal decisions yep. and then my, unilaterally. My opinion is to follow the recommendations from NISBA. If that's not the opinions of others here, that's okay. Wouldn't so, it make sense, excuse me, wouldn't it make sense to have an attorney review it? Yeah, after, after, after the appeal. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. And then bring it to the board. <coughs> the attorney reviews it each time. The attorney reviews it at the initial request and again when it's appealed. Because a lot of it is stuff that needs to be redacted. You and I and the superintendent Absolutely. are not going to stay redacted. Yeah. They look at it from a legal perspective every time. But every I think time. the attorney should have the final. Yeah. The policy doesn't say attorney, and it shouldn't, and it can't, because there has to be some, um, the attorney works for the Board of Education, basically, so the representation has to be district representation, and now the attorney, although everything is checked with the attorney, nobody's going to make that distinction, because uh, there are so many rules as far as boil and what can be released. So. Um, so it's our third reading, and we've, we've gotten the, um, Discussion about this. This is the third and actually fourth past the policy, third for the fourth meeting. So we're going to be in the motion on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those against? And any abstentions? Okay, motion fails. So we'll bring this back to um, further discussion because the policy still doesn't provide the clarification that the attorney um, recommended. And we'll see if maybe adding language to what happens after the board might give us some unity in deciding on this. Okay, so let's take this back to work, back to the drawing table. <laughs> exactly why the process plays how it is. So 2.19 motion. 
moved. Mr. Shapiro, second. Mr. Donnelly, discussion? I would just like to like to say that I do recognize the uh, additional task that Dr. Sestalo has taken on. Um, however, I, I'm not not comfortable with the compensation that she's going to be receiving. I think it's way over way over the top. Uh, that's all I can say. I, I'm just not comfortable with, with that kind of a raise. Any further comments? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those against? Nay. Any abstains? No. 2.19 moved. <coughs> So bring us to the end of action items, and we'll start with information items. Um, a report by the Strategic Planning Committee, which ties into the um, item administrative report that's coming up as number four. So, so uh, we recently had a strategic. We recently had a strategic planning committee meeting. Um, there was very good attendance by the public. Uh, there was a uh, lack of attendance by um, the administration. I, we, we discussed rebalancing, um, and uh, the, the rebalancing we decided was going to move forward. It was going to be administratively driven, and Dr. Castaldo was going to report on that tonight. So I would to her to the other administrator. Thank you, Mr. McKenzie. Second, is report from the Rockland County School Board Association meeting. I represented the Board of Education at the Rockland County School Board Association's meeting, which took place on April 8th. The meeting featured a presentation by Meredith Fox, you're probably familiar with her from the Nanuet uh, School District, as well as representatives from uh, Child Care Resources of Rockland. The focus was an item that's near and dear to our heart, um, preschool and pre-kindergarten, um, and I learned a lot of information that I'm sure you have um, and learned that our pre-k um, children in our districts across the state now have to take three tests as opposed to two which I thought that was excessive um, and there was a focus on a discussion on the importance of the link between preschools and elementary teachers and uh, principals in preparation for um, so that they may prepare preschoolers to the, um, the elementary education that they're about to undertake. I learned about the P3, P3 Summer um, Institute. Um, they strongly recommended that. Um, I attended it last year. Yeah, so I don't know what your um, feedback from that is, but it was very interesting to just hear what other districts are doing, and obviously I was proud to talk about a little bit about our pre-K program that's in-house here at Biola and um, our, our interest in making it a full day should the funding that we're advocating for become possible. And I brought out a package from Child Care Resources regarding the programs we might have it, but I'm going to pass it along for you guys. And that is the, the uh, that was the main discussion. Now, um, the Rockland County School Board Association conducts or holds a uh, annual dinner in May and selects a group of district um, employees to acknowledge every year. And this year, uh, the decision we voted to acknowledge assistant principals. So um, our assistant principals will receive an invitation from the Rockland County School Board. And I encourage my colleagues on the Board of Ed to try to make an effort to attend. Um, I will send you an email of the date. It's going to be at the NIFC for those of you who have attended before. It's usually a great event. So we'll have all our assistant principals from the middle and high school uh, being acknowledged that evening. And that is the um, conclusion of the Rockland County School Board Report. Next will be administrative reports. And um, Dr. Castaldo will report regarding the balancing. <coughs>
So as uh, Mr. McKenzie reported, the strategic planning team did meet, and from that we had a rebalancing report. We talked about um, a focus group spoke about rebalancing. So you can move to the next one. So the first piece we did was to define the issue. So if you look at the years, this is a court, I can't walk around. So the average percentages of the kindergarten enrollment, that's the first <coughs> column. If you look at the average percentage before 2016, Sherry Lane had 21% of the kindergarten students in Southern Central. R.P. Connor had 27%. This is an average of about 10 years before that. Montebello had 21%. Slosberg had 13%. And Viola had 18%. Average total was 279 students. Now, as you can see, it's not that we expect the buildings to be of equal numbers or equal percentage of students, but they do have a historical trend to the percentages they did have. In 11, 2011 and 2012, you can see that a skewing started to occur in the percentages. So Cherry Lane had 21% that year, R.P. Connor had 31%, Montebello was at 17%, so it's Virgo was at 10% and Viola was at 22% and a total number of students of 285. So you can see in 11-12, the population started to shift where they were living in Suffern Central. While our numbers stayed pretty steady, the population where they were living, where they were clustered, had shifted. So due to that skewing, the, the RP higher going up to 31%, so were going down to 10 Montebello going down to 17, there was a rebalancing that occurred for the 2012-2013 school year. And that brought the percentages again, more to those historical averages of 21%, 23%, 25%, 14% for Slotesburg, and 18% for Viola. And Mr. Donnelly, if you can put your arm straight out, that'll show everyone the column I was just looking at. No, to, to your left, just a little bit more. Well, no, 2013, 2012, 2013, just so we can say. Third column. Basically, the middle column. Just so everyone knows. Because I don't have a pointer and I don't have, and I can't walk right now, so unfortunately. Um, there we go. <laughs> Vanna White has entered the building. Thank you very much. So, what we're looking at this year in 1819, Cherry Lane is at 13% of the kindergarten enrollment, current kindergarten enrollment. R.P. Connor is 27%, Montebello is 28%, Slotesburg is 14%, and Viola is 17%, with a total of 255 students. So our number of students has gone down at this point, and there is a skewing even this year that has occurred. When we look at next year, 18-19, it's more skewed, it's more disturbing. Cherry Lane is 15% of the students. R.P. Connor is 41% of the current projected enrollment for kindergarten. Um, Montebello is 24%, Salzburg is 9%, Viola is 12% for a total of 211 students. That's a tremendous strain on the resources of one building. And a tremendous amount of students sitting in one building compared to the other student, the other <coughs> buildings. That skewing is what we're looking to correct with rebalancing. So if you could go to the next slide. Do you, I'm sorry. Yeah. Would, you, would you prefer to have questions okay, as so we go, or do you want to you know, hold them to the end? No. Now? Okay. The, the first column, yes. the percent before 2016, is, is, is different from the years 11, 12, and 12, 13. So. Well, that's an average. I just want to know that average. So. That's so I had. Before, I mean, I'm trying to figure out what the relevance is to that. 
I was to do the historical average. So that was taken from the years. I had 10 years worth of data. It was several years before 11, 12 that the data started up until this year. So that was just to give you an idea of the historical average was never that we were all completely even in percentages. We're expecting Slowsburg to be lower, for instance. So However, the percentages are off of what that historical you, average was. You may not know the answer to this, but how many, so you said that, oh, sorry, maybe you did that. was a 10 year average? Yes. So it's from 06 to 16. Is that what we're saying? That that first column was the average of 10 years? I would say it was more 07. I, I think it was 07 to 17. Okay. But I can get you that. Okay, it's, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. 07 to 16. Right. Okay. Any other questions on that slide? No, thank you. So what has our process been to kind of address this? We had a brainstorm, brainstorming session with uh, selected stakeholders. We then had the community forum, which was a part of the strategic planning committee um, meeting that we had. District leadership held a team work session last week. Um, We've been refining that myself and selected district leaders such as transportation, which is Ms. Rena Gessner, because she's highly knowledgeable about the transportation routes and what the neighborhoods look like. Uh, Lee Weber, Teresa Soli has been a part of it as well. And we are now having tonight the Board of Ed Information Report. The brainstorming session, the goals that came out of that were to regain the balance in our kindergarten sections by address, adjusting catchment zones for enrollment trends and ensure equity and resource utilization. Again, we don't want too much strain on one building and other buildings having extra resources. Specifically, the brainstorming session resulted in the goal of, if possible, two sections of kindergarten in each of four of the buildings and four sections in one building. Considerations that have been have gone into place in all of the conversations we have had is looking at things like the building capacity, optimal class sizes for kindergartners, special programs enrollment such as ENL and special classes, housing growth that's projected in the area, projected enrollment trends, transportation and traffic patterns, the geography and neighborhoods of the district, a timeline siblings and what would happen in the case of siblings and uh, looking at a K enrollment plan moving forward after this rebalancing. So that's the district map. Uh, the district map and where our buildings sit, um, the geography of that, the neighborhoods um, factor heavily into where you can draw catchment zones. For instance, Slothburg is way up at that top left, middle left of that the left uh, part of the triangle, I'm sorry. Slotesburg's way up there. There we go. And Cherry Lane's way at the other end. If you can get, I can, I can do it from here. Cherry Lane's way at the other end of the triangle. In the orange. Okay, orange, in the orange. There we go. Oh, it's colored light. So in the orange. So things like that factor heavily. <laughs> Traffic issues such as traveling Route 59 during, before and after school is an issue. Also, so is Route 202. Um, there's a tunnel area that's called, I want to say the west side. That's a problem as well. So the next one. Additional consideration is where are these K enrollment cluster sections? So if you look at our enrollment and our population right now, obviously if they're primarily 41% sitting at RP Connor, it's because our enrollment clusters of kindergartners are situated in what would be that pink area. Tipping, right. <laughs> Tipping into the green right on top of it. Yeah. That piece, tipping into the green, that's right here on, to the left of that. <laughs> we also have a cluster sitting in the Hillburn area, which is that yellowish above the green, yeah, right there we have a cluster as well. So we're looking at those areas right now and saying we have clusters of students and how can we reroute students in those areas to balance the kindergarten enrollment. So right now the rebalancing plan would adjust enrollment in those cluster areas to reach the goals of two sections in each building, four sections in the one building. 
The next steps in this are the final decisions to be made regarding which students, which neighborhoods, and notification of the families. Questions? My only question is sort of more on, mm -hmm. probably can't even answer it now, probably answer it somewhat, but with the understanding that something needs to be done in the immediate future, and beginning with this rebound, with this rebalancing, sorry, with this rebalancing for kindergarten enrollment, what is the, what is the plan for the future? Because Rebalancing kindergarten for next year is one step in a very long process. So I don't want to get ahead of myself or ahead of you, but what are we thinking for the future? Because this is simply a quick fix. So this is a quick fix for next year, and it does fix the skewing that is occurring at a big rate for next year. Going forward, I have been in contact with Western Suffolk BOCES. They are the ones that did our original projection and enrollment plan. Um, they have both software they can show us that will help us adjust for the numbers we balance and going future. We just want to do that again. They can also do a follow-up to the projection that they did for us, the enrollment projection numbers that they did. They can complete that by the end of next year, and then we'll be able to have some real conversations about what would be the best way to handle the enrollment trends going forward. So of course there's always the option of waiting until it gets skewed again and just rebalancing. There's always an option of completely looking at the elementary group, grade 12 experience. Um, Lee Weber's had a lot of thoughts on that as well in looking at that elementary experiencing and, and I love her term and her phrase is reimagining the elementary experience. That might be something that we want to explore in the future as well. I think the next first, the best first step next would be after the rebalancing would be that enrollment plan and going forward in, in a position of having information about what they're predicting. And, and that would be where we would utilize somebody like Western's other folks. Yes. And that's something that we could do potentially next year. Yes. We would start, we would start right away as soon as we have the resources and the are in straight buildings, possibly this summer. But, you know, I don't know what's the best time in the administration to have the work begin because it may not take one year, it may take more than one year to make any uh, changes if there will be any. It needs to be like a That first step again is, process. is partnering partnering with Western Suffolk BOCES to have them give us an idea of where they predict the enrollment will go in the future. We have several things coming up that will that will affect enrollment, things like the Sheldon and the Woodmont would affect enrollment as well, so we need their their professional opinion on where that's going to take us. Whoever, and I just want to share something that was um, shared with us um, thinking about um, you from an educator perspective, sharing with the committee that um, and it was a very well attended meeting, so I'm really thrilled about who members that showed up um, to participate and contribute questions and discuss really thoughtful discussions. So thank you for those who were there. Um, one of the things that was striking, and I was like nodding, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, is that it's not really a great scenario for any of our elementary buildings to have only one unit coming into the garden because that unit will continue to be one class only through their elementary experience. There is no chance of switching, changing things around. They're a very closed um, group, and then suddenly they're in a larger building with larger numbers. They have that experience of getting you know, sifted around. And, and, and you know, thinking from a parent perspective, I was nodding, that makes a lot of sense. You know, they're always making class and they have those social experiences and from an education perspective, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So this way, none of our elementary builders will have that one section of the people being together for five years. Any other questions? Board member comments. We started with Mr. Kern, we started with 
So we're going to move this to Karen. So we're going to change it around and start with who's right, Mr. McKenzie. I just wanted to uh, thank the folks of you. Some of you are here tonight that came to the Sorry. I was saying I just wanted to thank the folks that are here and those that couldn't make it tonight for coming to these strategic planning meetings and uh, being able to help us with the process. Um, moving forward, you know, Dr. Castaldo's uh, presentation tonight was very um, comprehensive and shows everything but the final lines of what we're going to do. But it's important that we do balance now because, as she said, the numbers are very skewed. And this gives us more time to, as we move forward, make a more uh, educated plan going forward to make sure that we can utilize our resources the best and have our kids enjoy the experience here. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McKenzie. Mr. Pizzoli, you have the Okay, sure. Uh, <laughs> Why not? I woke up. No, you didn't wake me up. I just so obviously everyone now knows that I am colorblind. <laughs> that is Sorry a fact. No, 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 that's okay. Uh, if I ever wear something that looks really bad, it's because my wife is upset with me about something. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, she says, yeah, wear, wear whatever you want. Okay. And I don't know what I want. <laughs> so it's, it's, but she's used to it. Um, a good good thing, boys baseball won today 2-1. Two, two uh, they were losing 1-0 going into the uh, bottom of the sixth, and they were able to win. So uh, congratulations to the boys ba baseball team. That's number probably zero of all the important things. Uh, congratulations to all of the uh, teachers and administrators who received a tenure tonight. Um, it's very special. Uh, getting your te tenure, I, I uh, both uh, received it. It was special uh, in the 1900s when we got it. Uh, 1847 for Don, I was right behind him in 1852. Um, it was special then and it's just as special now. Uh, Suffern has a terrific wealth of uh, staff members who are extremely bright, who are de dedicated, um, who really give 100% to um, our kids, and in some cases our grand grandkids. Um, and it's really great to see them uh, getting recognized and getting the ten tenure that they deserve. Um, in terms of the rebalancing, you know, this is gonna be a tough, tough time. Um, I remember when I, had my children, and all of a sudden, the schools that they were going to, they were shifted around. Um, so I know how it feels to be a parent, where one year you're going to one school, and all of a sudden, the following year, you're going to a different school after thinking that you're going to be in that school for six, six years, and then it doesn't happen. Um, but we have to take a look at the numbers, and we have to do what's, what's right, and uh, I know that Lee Weber is extremely experienced and, and is a great res resource to have um, all of the different ideas. And um, you may want to go online just to get used to some of these ideas, um, where schools, actually the elementary schools, some, some of them in different districts and different states, have um, specialty schools at the elementary level. You hear about it in high, high school, but some of them have it at the elementary level. Uh, and then there are elementary schools where it's, you know, like K through two, or it's paired schools, K, K through two, and then the next one is three, three through five, or, and everything gets shifted around. Um, and it's tough from the beginning because it's change. Nobody likes change, uh, <coughs> even when it's for something great. Uh, but we just have to realize that uh, things do change. I used to love having a rotary phone. <laughs> show it to our kids, and in some cases our grandkids. They have no idea what it is. And the A-track used to be wonderful. What's an A-track? Yeah. So things change, and really things do change for the better, and um, it may be tough in the beginning, but we all get used, used to it, and then we say, wow, this is really terrific. So um, we'll be 
doing well, and I'm going to pass it to Don because he's itching to get it away from me. Now, just a, a, a little comment. Now, when I was teaching at uh, Grammarville High School, I actually had uh, five children from the uh, same family. But I actually didn't have the five children coming through my class. I had number one, number three, and number five basically going back and forth between Ramapo and Spring Valley. So, uh, I'm sorry? Better school. Disagree. <laughs> uh, busy at school. But can you tell me what a Griffin is? Come on, uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, I'm very impressed with a number of the programs at uh, Suffren. In particular, uh, I attended the uh, spaghetti dinner. It's really good spaghetti, okay? But more importantly, um, the number of people who attended and the number of students who participated in that program was really, really good. Um, it's the same thing when I went to the STEAM program, okay? I think you know by now I'm very interested and I want to push uh, for the robotics uh, club. I know they're going out uh, to compete in the world's competition. Uh, I hope all of you uh, will make that donation and make it uh, successful. And I'm looking really for uh, the program to really start off in the elementary, go to the middle school, and top it off in terms of the high school. The number of scholarships that the students are uh, receiving, okay, because they're in the robotics program is phenomenal. And more importantly, the number of females who are in that program who are going into engineering. Okay, uh, three of them were going into engineering. I think the uh, fourth one was uh, computer studies. So suffering is, has a, a great uh, history, and the idea of being on the board is to make sure that we keep the fiscal responsibility, okay, as low as possible, but yet make sure we have the highest level of success for the students in the district. We did okay. Thank you, Mr. Karen. Well, Mr. Johnson, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I'd just like to congratulate Judy Veltini, whose husband, Bobby, um, actually coached here for some 30 years. He was inducted into the Buckley County Hall of Fame uh, over the weekend. I know he did a tremendous amount of work with me. Uh, I hope he straightened you right out. <laughs> But I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. It couldn't have happened to a better guy. Uh, well deserved. I think he wears blue and white better than black and gold. Uh, I really do think he bleeds suffering. So Judy, again, congratulations. School board dinner is June 12th. If you want to make a note of that, um, it's a Wednesday evening. And again, IFC board. Um, it was great honoring the 10 year recipients. We appreciate all their work, and it's always delightful to see the families' um, impressions and pride and to get to meet the families, especially the little ones that are beaming with pride for dad or mom. It's always fun to have them around. Um, always a uh, pleasure to honor our um, National Merit uh, nominees and finalists. They worked very hard to achieve that uh, coveted status. <coughs> um, STEAM was incredible on April 6th. Uh, escaping Chernobyl was not easy. I couldn't have figured how to get out of there. <laughs> the kids did. And it was amazing seeing the, the young students interacting with the older students. <laughs> They were very excited and motivated because the you know, instructions were given by our high school students that interaction was actually really a joy. I have a couple of really amazing pictures of them all huddled and trying to figure out the, uh, the uh, chemistry tables that I found very difficult in school. Um, also, um, I want to thank um, Ms. Isoli and the business department of Suffern Central for all your hard work to produce a budget. Um, that we support. And um, I also want to thank Dr. Castaldo for her work with the entire administrative staff in suffering um, to produce uh, the rebalancing formula in time for kindergarten registration. Um, so thank you for all your work. Um, finally, I'd like to call public participation. Public participation on non-agenda items. Please 
introduce your name and your affiliation with the district. My uh, name is Eileen Sheldon. One second. Um, our um, district clerk will be the time keeper. We have three minutes, and the entire segment is 30 minutes long. Please address all comments to the Board of Education President and refrain from discussing a staff member or student. Thank you. My name is Eileen Sheldon. I'm a parent of two children in Connor Elementary. And tonight I ask the Board as a parent and an educator to be careful as you forge ahead. At a time when public education is under attack from every angle, I fear that the current path we are on, what it could do to our children, our schools, and our district. Recent events do not portray Suffern Central in a very positive light, and no doubt it will impact the quality of educators from the classroom to the district office that we can draw in. The lasting impact of your actions could go on long beyond your time of sitting on this Board of Education, making us vulnerable to many unwanted and potentially unintended outcomes and consequences. Calling teachers and community members' actions deplorable for exercising our democratic right to question our elected officials is insulting. The election of 2018 may be over, but the next one is right around the corner. And it is our right, in fact, our duty, to question your actions and motives if we feel they do not best serve Suffering Central and its children. Admonishing us for not coming to meetings more regularly is also a slap in the face to many working families, which is what this district is. There is an unspoken trust that we as a community gives you when we elect you to the Board of Education. We shouldn't have to be at every meeting to, te to test your honesty. Agendas are posted, meetings are recorded, we have the capacity to monitor from home, and when as a parent, a teacher, or a community as a whole, we are not comfortable with the direction you are taking us, we take our opportunity to come and speak our voices. I wonder how many meetings you attended regularly before becoming members of the Board of Education yourselves. We want, you want us to trust you, but I know that over a month ago, a parent foiled information from you and has yet to get it received. How are we supposed to feel that you have our children's best interest in heart when this is your behavior? Certain media outlets, although, are getting information they foil in a timely fashion, which is also concerning to us. The tone and belligerence at times that has been directed at parents is at best inappropriate and often offensive. If teachers ever spoke to parents or children the way you spoke to us at several meetings over the last few weeks, we would be reprimanded. You are bringing about a rift in our district that may be driven to a point of being irreparable. So please consider your legacy. Consider what you want to be remembered as the Board of Education of Suffering Central. Did you build us up? or open us up for problems. Thank you. The actions you've taken, the discord you've created, and the absolute lack of transparency you've shown this community. And if I remember correctly, the kids' first slate of candidates ran their campaign claiming discord among the board, claiming that the board did not listen to the kids in the community, and claiming lack of transparency. Well, over the last past 10 months, you've not only perfected those three, you have far exceeded all that was imaginable. Expect a lack of transparency. This board event has logged approximately 480 hours of meetings with 337 of those hours in executive session, 70% of your time. 26 meetings held thus far during your tenure, 13 half special meetings. Let's compare that to last year, which is average for the years prior to that. 20 meetings the entire year, one special meeting. 53 hours of total meetings, 24 hours in executive session for 45% of the time in private. Yet with that little small number of meetings, we were still able to make sure that our, our district was top in the county, top 35 in the state, and top 100 in the country. So we're not a falling plane or whatever the, the, the discussion was at the March 19th meeting by one of the board members. If you look back histor historically, the numbers of the special meetings were nominal and more hours are spent in public than in private. That's transparency. 
Mr. McKenzie said the excuse for having these special meetings was to get things done. Well, clearly, we didn't have that many special meetings, and we got a lot of work done and maintained, actually increased greatly our averages and our percentages in being a top-rated school. So I can only assume that the reason for the special meetings was with, with respect to the agenda setting, which has been a huge issue and a topic of conversation with this board and this president for many, many years. Special meetings, the agenda is set the same way. The policy does not distinguish between special and regular meetings. So if you guys were creating these special meetings and these agendas outside of the superintendent's knowledge, then you were violating policy each and every time. Discord and divisiveness. Look around and you don't just say much about it. Watch the videos of the meetings. However, one thing I will say, having all of these people, and I kind of add on to what you said, having all of these people at the meetings is not what you want. For a board of ed member to say that that is a positive thing, they're out of touch with the reality. The public doesn't want to have to come to meetings. The public, the kids don't want to have to stand up here and speak. The public wants this board to act professionally and responsible and in the best interest of this district. What the public does want is they want to be home watching Game of Thrones, not sitting here at a meeting. When the policies don't fit your agenda, you change the policies. When the people who work in the district don't give you the answers you want, you replace them. When it's not enough to replace them, you hire special investigators, special attorneys, and special friends to go on a wild goose chase to find that needle in a haystack. And, if all, and all of that leaves the door wide open for corruption and misallocation of resources in violation of your fiduciary duties as board members dealing with $141 million in taxpayer dollars. <laughs> If I can just, just finish my Please thought. Although this board will deny, it clearly has, has um, offered payback for the um, getting elected last year. You have a district clerk, election clerk, who helped with your campaign. What are you, what are you going to do to ensure that this year's election is going to be not only um, fair and partial and legal, but that it will be, um, it will be, won't be biased by his allegiance to the kids first people. There's also a security company that is the okay. partner of the security the time company. Is up. You asked the I, I just want to finish my. I just have one small, small thing. Please. I will. Yeah. I'm trying to speak Thank really you. fast. Thank you. The partner, the partner in the, in the security company is an ex-partner of Angus McKenzie's. I don't know if that was disclosed up during the meeting. There's also a solar power company who has been solicited by Angus uh, by right. Mr. Cairns who has a friend who's the principal of this solar company. He has not only pushed and pressured uh, staff members to deal with this solar company, he has also and said that that's why he, he, voted for the teachers, he voted for the teacher's contract, so he needs this Next. contract and the solar company okay. deal to go through. That, my friends, leads to corruption, Thank inappropriate, and misallocation of money. I just have one comment about the no, one there is from no last week. We all want to hear it. We want to hear it. We want to hear it. We're done. Thank this you. board of ed, mm -hmm. under this Thank president, very much. cornered up, up an employee at the last meeting, the strategic Please planning committee meeting, on. cornered them Mr. in, 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 in time the meeting, up. and uh, basically, it, from, our, from our view, okay. the public's view, time is up. Um, and attacked her. She was in the corner of the, of the, of the room the time is and up. had four, board members, the time four is board members, which is actually a meeting Please. under New York State law, which Please was address not address your concerns. Nor was not in writing. Nor was not publicized. And in fact, I think three of the board members had no idea that there was a meeting going on. Thank you. That being said, I, I thank you for you know, me being courteous. Um, um, Give me the courtesy. Well, of you've been in my you know, place before, and you need to continue. And I've never, and I've never stopped anybody you. from talking. sentiments of our former speakers but that's not why I'm here tonight um, I just wanted to uh, thank the board for accepting the tenure of some of the colleagues that received their tenure tonight um, I'm privileged to work with Carolyn Scotland who is generous of heart and spirit we've shared students and um, we've worked together she's a delight to work with I've also had the honor to work with Danielle Castaldo. She was an amazing special ed supervisor. And then while we mourned her departure as our supervisor, um, we were delighted to have her back as our assistant principal. Um, her leadership is great and 
Um, one of the things that stand out most is last year on DC, she showed that leadership by helping me clean up projectile bus <laughs> for one of our students. So she is near and dear to my heart. Um, I also recently joined the green team at SMS and under the leadership of Karen Mena and Elio Figuerella, who are just terrific. Um, we are moving on a forward path toward adopting 21st century green sustainable initiatives. I also would like to thank the board for continuing uh, to support us as we look into further greening our cafeterias through the consideration of removing styrofoam trays, moving to paperboard, and hopefully eventually moving to reusable food trays, which you're going to hear more about from the kids in the coming weeks. And I'd like to give a special shout out to the hardest working woman in show business, Teresa Soldi, for helping the green team answer questions during her establishing of her budget presentation for tonight. Um, she's been helpful with uh, talking about the potential economics of these changes. Um, she really is such a valued member of our district. She's offered to come and help uh, the kids and talk to them about the economics so that they can understand what goes into it. So thank you very much for all your work. Lastly, I would encourage the board to attend one of the great things that happens in our district, the 12th Annual String Extravaganza at the high school tomorrow at 7.30. I've been a parent volunteer since my daughter was in fourth grade. She's now in her third year of college, and I still volunteer. Um, it's an amazing group of students, um, 450 children from fifth grade through 12th grade. The dedicated effort of our music staff is unparalleled by any district in, I don't know, I would say the country. So um, I would encourage you to come out and see some of the good things that our district does. That is why we are so emotional about what happens in their district, how other people view us. Um, and I just want you to keep that in mind. Thank you. Cooper, one of the 11 nurses in the school district. I just have a quick question. Um, action item 2.06, contract for <coughs> nursing services. Can you just explain what that was? Are you allowed to do that? <laughs> Each year the middle school takes a Boston and a Washington DC trip. Okay. None of the school nurses were able to go on, so that's the special contract. So okay. we can have a school nurse on each of those trips. Okay. So that's our usual Thank you. Any further comments? Hi, I'm Jonathan Turk. I live in Southport, New York. Um, I, I do appreciate you guys staying underneath the tax cap. That's that's great for our community. Um, for those that were endorsed by our current mayor in the village of Suffern, he is proposing a 14% tax increase, which would probably affect our district tremendously. So I hope that those of you with relationships with them would maybe reach out to hope that they could bring that level down, because right now we're about to bust the cap um, about 12%, which is going to drive lot for sales on uh, for sale in the, in the uh, far along. So I know that some of you guys have close close relationships with them. So if you'd like to reach out with them, you know, on our behalf, we'd really, really appreciate it. Mr. Mackenzie, if you're Clark, that would be great. Thanks. I have twins who go to wise beginnings. Uh, they're uh, four years old, they'll have to be five. I'd like to know when we're going to get to see the new man. Uh, we have some concerns on what school they're going to be going to. So, if you would kindly email Dr. Scala directly, okay. uh, she will be able to probably give you directions on what to expect. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. 
speech. I did not prepare to speak this evening. Um, I'm just curious, you said that we could email Ms. Dr. Casaldo about the rezoning. Why is it that if you have the information that has not been released to the public yet? They've been working on it. I don't, I, so um, we're sending I'm assuming as soon as, as soon as they have it, they can advise individual parents. Okay, because I know, because, I mean, we're just curious. We're Right now, we're at RP Con yeah. and we bought our house four years ago specifically because we would be attending R.P. Connor. We have family that goes there. Um, you know, not to say that any of the schools are better than any of the others. I don't know enough about them, really, to, to make that opinion. Um, but we're just curious if we're going to be moved, when we're going to know. Because I have an interview in three weeks at R.P. Connor for my kids. And meanwhile, you're saying we could send an email and find out, but yet there are so many parents <coughs> in the dark that don't know so when and where. None of the decisions have been made firmly yet. Part of that is because no matter when we look at the map, it, it keeps changing the number of students in each catchment zone. Those decisions will be made by the end of this week or next week, so that in advance of going to those registration dates, you would know which school to go to. All of our elementary schools are obviously very good. They're very strong schools. I can guarantee you that I think it was, you have twins, yeah. you yes. said, twin four-year-olds. Yes. They'll have a fabulous experience wherever they are, but we will let you know that information as soon as we have it. Uh, as I referenced before, Ms. Gessner and I have been working on it daily to kind of get firm up the streets for sure. Um, I know that um, Mr. Shapiro commented about students and changing buildings. What we're trying to identify and have been able to identify to some extent at this point are students who do not have siblings already in a school, and so therefore it wouldn't be that a family has, you know, two different elementary schools that their their children would be in. So, but I will let you know as soon as possible. So that's something you're working on. If somebody is already, like my sister Laura is two in RP Connor, and she's two going into RP Connor, you wouldn't necessarily separate. Correct. Correct. So you we are looking to not do that. We're identifying kindergartners who sit, who are in clusters. <laughs> and do not have siblings already in the school. Right. And actually, I think we're all in agreement that you don't want 89 children in one school and 15 in another. So I think we're all in agreement for safety reasons and for educational reasons. Um, I just, I guess I speak on behalf of the parents that are just very confused. Um, you know, like I said, I, we go to our wise beginning school and we see the president. There's 20 students that just don't know where they're going. So you will have that information very quickly. Okay, thank you. This is not supposed to be a question and answer session, it's supposed to be comments, but you're welcome to come up. I'll make a comment. If you can. I'll make a comment. Okay. I will make a question. I didn't really want to get up. I'm just, my, my comment about the rezoning, I'm, I'm hearing these young families, Amy Bloom from uh, my children go to, um, um, so it didn't really come up at that meeting, the, and it's been a thought of mine since then, and just listening to them. For kids who have kindergartners and the rebalancing, the following year, the concern would be if there's no younger children in those same areas that are being rezoned. You just is there consideration? I'm sure there is, but that in the years to come, that these families won't then, you know, now they're three or two year old, a three year old who's in kindergarten might now have to go to another school to rebalance, and yet their kindergartners are now in, you know, second or third grade. And just because I don't know if there's information that like the younger siblings of those because we're just looking at kindergartners so to do the rebalancing. So I just the concern that we're just going to keep rebalancing, keep moving people around, would keep young families. You know, like we had talked about at the meeting. You know, you want to say when you buy your house that this is where you're sitting for, and just that it doesn't keep changing. So for this following year, we understand it, and we all know it needs something needs to be done. But just to consider that, you know, I don't know if we've looked at younger siblings in those same areas that are being used. Sorry, if you 
recall at the meeting, we did speak a little bit about how often it's need, we needed rebalancing. Right. So the skewing has occurred. The, the last major redistricting was done in 2004-2005. Uh, then there was the contemplation of doing it in 2008, but it was not done. It was done in 2011. We're looking at, again, doing it now. So typically, in this district, when we rebalanced, it's those lines have held fast and worked well given enrollment uh, for four to six years. The point of doing the Western Suffolk BOCES updated study would be to let us know that that is going to be what holds um, true for us as well. We wouldn't be looking to rebalance again over and over. What we'd be looking to do possibly after that study is actually looking at the entire elementary experience. And that would take several years to put into effect to even come up with the plans of what we would want. And that would mean that these children that we're moving right now would be in fourth or fifth grade at that point. Um, younger siblings would be following along because we're not going to be looking to move those lines again that quickly. Thank you, Dr. Castaldo. At this time, we will close this segment and acting superintendent comments. Um, I just wanted to say some of the speakers spoke about it as well. We've had some marvelous things go on in the district in the past few weeks. The STEAM Expo, and we'd like to thank, thank the REACH Foundation for all of their support of that. It was a fabulous experience. Let me talk a little bit about what I've seen in the classrooms. Um, we do a lot of project-based learning, and Ken Wojciechowski is our project-based project -based learning coach. That's tough this time of night. And in Slopesburg Elementary, I was able to go to Farmville, where they're building chicken coops and milking cows and getting water out of the ground. So that was a fabulous experience to see as well. And today, I got to see peak nests being built in R.P. Connor. So we have some great things going on, both after school and in our classrooms, to give our students those innovative learning experiences that Suffern Central is known for. And it's happening K-12, all seven buildings. So I just wanted everyone to be aware of that. <coughs> Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you for any of the comments that you met, made. They only inform us for the future. Thank you, Dr. Gustavo. We need a motion to adjourn the Open Central School Board meeting. Mackenzie, second. Mr. Karen, all the behavior of the state of Aye. 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 Aye.